morning and welcome to Equippers Essex Online. We are here on Facebook and on YouTube and it's fantastic to have you with us here this morning. So let's get ready to allow our worship team to lead us in praise and worship this morning. I want to give you what you deserve and hold up the
Spirits are rushing with fire of God for within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent and turn from sin, revival embers motoring, breath of God, fan us into flame. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Oh, we need your spirit, Lord. Hearts that burn with holy fear, purified. Faith and deep, refine us by strength and worth we So be a church, you bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and kingdom come is what we pray. Cause we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, a holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, just pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Cause we can hear the wind blowing, blowing, blowing. Move upon our praise, sons and daughters sing. We can hear the wind blowing, blowing, blowing. Let the redeemed prophesy and sing. of your presence pour your spirit out pour your spirit out a holy anointing the power of your presence pour your spirit out pour your spirit out pour your spirit out Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord. Father, we have open hearts and open minds and ready to receive everything that you have for us. Father, we pray that your love would come and transform us this morning, Father. Lord, we choose to fix our eyes on you, Lord. 
Father, we choose not to look at the circumstances around us, but to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you, our beautiful Saviour. So come this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. And we're ready to receive everything you have for us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So coming up, we are heading into September and our Connect groups are coming back. They're going to be back on the 14th of September. So if you're not in a Connect group and you'd like to be, then just contact the church. Um, There's lots of Connect groups all over Colchester and uh, we'd really love to have you in one of our Connect groups. Simultaneously, youth is starting on the 23rd on the Friday. So they're getting back together 7 p.m. at the barn. So that's for our teens and our young people. So that's really going to be fantastic for them. And then coming up on the 24th, we've got our free family fun festival, which is just going to be amazing. It's in Castle Park and it's all the local churches in Colchester coming together. So it's just going to be a great time of fellowship and fun and our band's going to be playing there. So um, invite people, bring people along and we're going to really have a wonderful time there. And then on the 27th, we are having our relationship seminar, and that is going to be at Wivenhoe House. And that is for anybody um, who is hoping to be in a relationship. Come along to that. It's really going to be a great time. Uh, Next week, we have got Pastor John Fares from Legacy Church, and he is going to be with us. He's going to be preaching for us. So that's really going to be fantastic. So be sure to tune in for that. And uh, I think you're going to be really blessed. So now it's time for us to come around our giving. And uh, we're just such a generous church. And so let's prepare our hearts and let's get ready to give this morning. This morning, Pastor Barry is preaching for us. So let's get ready for that. Let's prepare our hearts and uh, prepare for that message. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the season we live in. Thank you for the privilege of being your church in this time. Thank you for so many different personalities, so many different gifts. None of us have got it all, but when we come together, together we have all that you need for us to have. We love you, Jesus. Have your way this morning, I pray. Amen. So we've uh, been talking recently, probably you analyzed the last six months or so, we've been talking about dreams We've been talking about goals, we've been talking about flow, and I believe every single one of you has a dream in your heart. I believe every single one of you has got a gift that is unique to you, and here's the thing we need to grasp. It has an echo in eternity. Your life counts. Your life counts. And the trouble is, through life we go and we get dreams and visions, and you'll hear someone like me preach, and you'll walk away from a Sunday and go, yes, my life counts, yes, I've got a dream, but over the course of time, who knows, so often that ebbs away, and you feel like, oh, I'm just going to go through the motions, I'm just going to try and get through the week, I'm just going to try and get through the month, and the years pass you by, and if you're not careful, that dream that was in your heart never becomes a reality. And I want you to understand, you're in good company, a lot of people experience that. But I want to believe for a fresh encounter with Jesus today. Because you are important. You know, the word says that you have got things to do that God ordained from the beginning of time. You're important. God's put something in you, and it counts. I love this idea of legacy. You know, the day's going to come when, when I pass away, but I want to live the life that counts and echoes later. That people are saying, oh, I was inspired by that guy, and I'm going to live better because of it. And there would be all kinds of different things in your world, but if you could just fulfill that dream in your heart... It will echo in eternity. Your life is bigger than just little old you in little old Colchester. It counts. Is there an amen somewhere in the house? Here's the thing. Because these dreams, these visions, these gifts are God-ordained, there's always going to be a challenge. Who knows that? Satan, the word Satan means adversary. He is against us. So when you come to a church environment and you get inspired to go and live a life for Jesus, you bet your bottom dollar you walk out this and the challenge will come by raise of hand. You experience that challenge. It's real. But when we get together, we sharpen each other. We challenge each other. We pick each other up. But here's the best thing. When you have an encounter with Jesus, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. Today's title is... Jesus showed himself again. Jesus showed himself again. Turn around, tell the person behind you, Jesus is going to show himself again. Well, the people at the back are all going to hear it. 
I'm getting abuse from the second row. <laughs> Just see, I told you there was an adversary out there. <laughs> it's me. The grace of God is outrageous. I love the idea of grace being undeserved favour. God loves me just because he loves me, not because I deserve it. God sets me up to win, not because I'm great, but because he's great. The grace of God, when I mess it all up, and believe me, and I know that's hard to believe, I mess it up often. But he loves me, and he's for me, and he'll continually pick me up. Here's the thing with this idea of a vision. We're all different with different gifts and different personalities. You know, some people are, are a bit uncertain and a bit unsure and not particularly confident and don't have much boldness. And you, you hear a message and think, yeah, I have got a dream in my heart, but you're a bit tentative and you're kind of full of doubt and unsure and it, it's difficult for you. But then you've got other people who are uber confident, zealous people and really up for it. And you come on, I'm going to take on the world. I can do it all by myself. And there's that kind of person. And then there's really gifted people who are so gifted, they just get lazy. Have you ever met that person in, a, in an education environment who are so flipping brainy? They literally don't do an ounce of study and get an A. You met that person? Yeah, that wasn't me. I met loads of people like that. But there are people like that in life who don't have to try. They can just do it. And it's brilliant. It's amazing. But the, the challenge for them is not to get lazy, not to get blasé. Here's a reality for every type of person. To live a God-given life, you need God in the middle of it. You cannot do it on your own. We all need the Holy Spirit in the middle. We all need continual moments with Jesus. And we don't want to be a group of people that live from encounter to encounter. We want to host his presence continually. Now, I want to wake up every morning and say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. But encounters with Jesus are still valid and important. And I want to believe with you today that you're going to have a fresh encounter with Jesus. We're going to look at the lives of Thomas and Peter and David. You may see something of yourself in these stories. If not, you'll find yourself somewhere else. But the key in all of it is they all needed encounters to achieve what God put on their lives. Are you with me? So we know the story of Thomas. Um, Jesus has died. He told them he was going to die, but they were still shocked when he did. And he rose again. Can you put yourself in that picture? We know the story. We've read it in the Bible. Now imagine you're there. Jesus comes into the room. They're all worried and panicking and thinking, "What's going we've been zealous for Jesus and now they're all going to come for us. And then Jesus rocks up into the room, the actual Jesus. How are you feeling there? Don't just read other pages and go, Jesus came into the room. Your heart is going, come on! There's something on the inside of you going, yes, he's back. There, something's happening on the inside of me. Well, something's not happening on the inside of you. Come on, people. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. He died. They're down. They're like, oh, no, it's all gone wrong. And then he shows himself again. Something goes off on the inside of him. It's amazing. But then they have a chat with Thomas. Thomas, you should have been there. Jesus came. And what does Thomas do? Yeah, that's nice for you guys. But I didn't see him. And there's something about testimony and something about encounters that needs to be personal. The word testimony ultimately means do it again. And testimony is powerful. You know, I could regale you countless stories from my life which are amazing for me. And the hope is that as I tell you my story, you start getting a hope and a faith in your life to say, if you could do it for Pastor Barry, you could do it for me. Do it again, Lord. That's the point of testimony. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Why? Because when you tell your God stories, it sparks faith in someone else. When you look through the Old Testament, all the old fathers of the faith used to just pass the stories on. They used to tell the stories. God took us out of Egypt. God parted the Red Sea. God brought the walls down. They told the stories, testimony after testimony of God's goodness. And what happened? It sparked faith in the next generation. You need to spark faith in the next generation. You've got a story to tell. Tell it. Tell it. You know, I could tell you stories of down times. When I was a young guy, you know, I, most of you know I used to play football, but when that came to an end, I started training to be a personal trainer, and I worked as a lifeguard for a bit. And I was proper boring. You know, you're getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Has ever, anyone ever worked at a swimming pool? No. So you're getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning, so you've got to be there at 6, so you're getting up at 5, and uh, you're sitting by the pool, and you're tired. And the water is going, and I'm like, 
no one drowned now. But these are, these are, you know, competition swimmers. They are going up and down and up and down. And I'm just tired watching them. And I didn't really like the job. But what I was trying to do is transition out of being a lifeguard into being a personal trainer. And I was able to do some of that and develop myself in the leisure centre. This was in Chelmsford. Uh, I lived with the guy who was the manager of Rotors. And so, of course, I took him for a pint and said, sort me out some extra hours in the gym, will you? That's where I want to go. He said, of course, Barry, not a problem. And this is what he said to me. He said, on a Monday night, we're really, really busy. I don't need you in the gym, but if you could be in the premises, I'll pay you to be in the premises so that when we're busy, I know I can just page you and you'll come running. Yeah, I'll do that. So merrily I go and I, I turn up on the premises and you might know I'm very sociable so I'd sit in the coffee shop and chat to everyone who'd come past me and laugh and joke and occasionally I'd get a message, can you come and do an induction for someone, they're new to the gym and I'd head down there. It was great, enjoyed it. Then the manager of the centre went to do training on a Monday night and he saw my record of my employment and my, my timesheet and I'd filled out the timesheet for a Monday night, been in the gym. He called me in, Barry, uh, I see you put on your timesheet work to the gym on a Monday night. Yeah, you weren't there. Y yeah, well, I was in the building. Yeah, well, I trained in the gym and you weren't there. I'm not paying you not to be in the gym. And I was like, well, but the manager said to me, if, as long as I'm in the building because he's really busy uh, and that'll help. And he was like, I'm not. And then he called the manager. The manager denied it. The manager threw me under the bus. <laughs> Literally. And I'm like, what on earth? Who knows in that moment when you, and I've got the sack. Who knows? Well, I didn't get the sack. They said, you can get the sack or you can choose to leave. It will be better for you. So I went, see ya. And, uh, but at that moment, you're gutted. I didn't feel I'd done anything wrong. I'd done what I was asked. The manager threw me under the bus. I threw him under a bus later. <laughs> and uh, it was tricky. But who knows in that moment, when you feel like you've lost your way, you need Jesus. And right there, sometimes it's in the valley you find out who you really are. Because in the valley, you need Jesus. On the mountaintop, we celebrate. But in the valley, we need Jesus. And I could tell you story after story where I've been down in the dumps and I've had an encounter with Jesus and he's picked me up. And as I look back now, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Probably now I'd still be working there. Because you know when you just get into a cycle and you just don't move? I was sitting by the pool at 6 a.m. And I just kept doing it. And then you think, what are you doing? I actually needed to be moved on. And God, I think, ordained it that I'd get moved on. It was uncomfortable, but he was there. I could tell you story after story. I could tell you some great stories. I could tell you stories where we decided we were going to launch a church nearly 18 years ago now. And we didn't know if anyone had come, but we told some people on day one. We opened up the doors and about 100 people walked in. I was like, yes. Do you know why? Because Jesus was in the middle of it. And my faith went, yes. So in the down moments, Jesus was there. In the up moments, Jesus was there. And I could tell you story after story. Here's the thing. I hope you enjoy hearing my stories. But you need your own story. It's better when you've got your own story. And this is where Thomas finds himself. Thomas says to the guys, I'm really pleased for you. Not quite sure if I believe you. I think you might be hallucinating. I need to see him for myself. In fact, I even need to put my finger in his holes. That's kind of creepy right there. But that was, that's where he was at. I need to see it for myself. Here's the grace of Jesus. He shows himself again. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. Now Thomas called the twin. And I love this idea of the twin because I'm sure he had a twin. But it's almost like we can relate to this straight away because we are spirit and flesh. We're kind of a twin within ourselves. And always there's this wrestle, isn't there? My flesh wants to do this, but in my spirit I need to do this. And who knows, every time you buy into the spirit, you're going to go somewhere good. Every time you buy into the flesh, you're probably not. But there's this battle. Here's Thomas the twin. One of the twelve. He was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my fingers into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. 
And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus showed himself again. I don't know if you're someone who sometimes finds yourself in doubt. I don't know if you're someone who's got a big dream in your heart and you're so cautious and so not sure. Here's the thing. Jesus is the same. And if you need Jesus to show himself again, Jesus is willing. Jesus is willing. He showed himself again. And what happens? Thomas's faith stores through the roof. I feel like Thomas gets a bad rap. What do we call him? Doubting Thomas. The reality is he had a moment of doubt. By raise of hand, have you ever had a moment of doubt? If you've not got your hand up right now, I'm going to say big fat liar. <laughs> We've all had a moment of doubt. Thomas had a moment of doubt and now he's famous for it. But here's the thing. If anyone follows Thomas's story, after having a moment of doubt, and Jesus being gracious enough and loving enough and kind enough to show himself again, Thomas' faith soared. Thomas traveled the furthest out of any of the disciples. He went to India. And he went there and he planted the church. And to this day, he's renowned for that in India. But we don't call him Thomas, the guy who planted the church in India. We call him Doubting Thomas. Bad rap. If you ever hear someone calling that, go, hang on a minute, I need to put you right. He had a moment. I've had a few moments. But here's the thing. Thomas, after having his moment, Jesus showed himself again. His faith soared and he acted. And he wrote the story that God wanted him to write. There's a story in you. There's a story in you. There's a story in you. Are you going to encounter Jesus in such a way that your faith will soar so that you will write a story? Someone needs to hear your story. I love that. I love the fact that Jesus was so gracious. He didn't say for crying out loud, Thomas, what's the matter with you? They've told you the stories, just believe them. No, no, he showed himself again. He said, here's my hands. I know you need to do that. If that helps you, I'm willing. Here's my side. I know you need to touch that. If that helps you, I'm willing because there's bigness on the inside of you. There's life on the inside of you. There's dreams on the inside of you. Yeah, come on. So that's for someone here today. If you're, you're in, a, in a period of doubt, today is the day I challenge you to say, Jesus, I need to see you again. I need to do something inside of me because I know I've got a story to write and I'm up for it. Amen? Amen. Peter, very different character to Thomas. We all know Peter, very zealous. He's the guy when Jesus comes walking on the water and everyone else is hiding in the boat going, it's a ghost. He's like, no, it's not. It's the Lord. And he looks out there and he says, Jesus, if you call me, I could come and I could do that. And Jesus says, I'm willing. I'm up for it. Come on then. And what does Peter do? The zealous guy, the up for it guy, the guy who can do it all, the guy who's full of faith. He says, here I come. Imagine that. Just imagine it for a moment again. We read these stories and we bypass them. What's the first step like? He gets out of the boat onto water. And he goes, Ooh. Oh, are you with me? Are you with me? I wonder how many of us believe we can do it all, but we're scared actually to put our foot where it shouldn't be going, in the natural. Some of our call is spiritual. And if we believe in the spiritual, we'll see something in the natural that shouldn't be possible. There are going to be people in this room who are rubbish at business, but you're going to become millionaires in business. Not because you're great in here, but because he's great in you, and he wants to get money through you to fund mission. There's going to be people here. Yeah, come on. There's going to be people here who are going to lay hands on people and see them get miraculously healed. Not because you're great, because he's great, and you're just brave enough and stupid enough to say, in Jesus' name, be healed. And they'll be going, Wow. There's a story in you. And Peter is this zealous guy. And he walks. But then he has that moment. And again, here comes the adversary. What happens? He gets all spiritual. And then he suddenly gets all fleshy. Everyone has it. I'm walking on water. This is a Look, guys. Look what I'm doing. I actually started moonwalking at some point. He's on the water. He's walking along. It's fantastic. And then he suddenly thinks, what on earth am I doing? Has anyone ever stepped out for God? Walked on water in effect. And then suddenly thought, what on earth am I doing? And he sinks. 
And what does Jesus do? He doesn't say, Peter, you absolute goon. What's the matter with you, man? He reaches down and he grabs him. He shows himself to him again. I'm still here. I've still got you. You took your eyes off me for a moment there, but here I am. Here I am. Come on, people have got stories of faith to write. Someone needs to look Jesus in the eye and say, this doesn't feel natural to me, but I'm just going to keep my eyes on you and I'm going to take a step at a time. No one is called to a leap of faith. Everyone is called to a step of faith. And if you keep your eyes on Jesus and just take little steps, suddenly you'll be so far away from the boat, you'll be like, wow, where on earth am I? But you're going to be in the flow of Jesus. You've got a story to write. You've got a story to write. This is the guy, Peter, who when they come to arrest Jesus, he grabs the sword and lops his ear off. He's a proper passionate guy. I sometimes think, I'm going to be that guy. Anyone relate to that? I'm, I'm that guy. You back off, my Jesus. He's not having it. And Jesus is like, simmer down, Peter. This is all part of the plan. Leave it, will you? Sorts his ear right out, just like that. Awesome. Imagine that bloke. We forget that bloke, don't we? He's literally just had his ear cut off. And then within seconds, it's back on again. What's happening with him? What's going on in his heart? Where's my ear gone? Oh, my ear's back again. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All kinds of things going on in these stories. But what's happening is faith is being stirred. Character is being changed. Because although Peter is zealous and up for it, he needs Jesus. Because sometimes in his zealousness, he has no wisdom. We need each other. In my zealousness, I need your wisdom. So I don't start punching people. But we're in this together. They arrest him, Jesus, and take him away. And now Jesus isn't there. The zealous man's on his own. And here's what happens. Luke 22, verses 54 through 57. Having arrested him, Jesus, they led him and brought him to the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of a courtyard and sat down together. Can you just turn to the person next to you and say, they kindled a fire. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat amongst them. And a certain servant girl. Now, here's the thing. We know where this is going. This is a servant girl. She's no one particularly important in the time. It's just a young girl. This zealous guy. This guy who walks on water. This guy who lops off the ear. Now, Jesus isn't there. A little servant girl challenges him. This man was with him. A certain girl was with him, sat by the fire, looked at him intently and said, this man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, woman, I, I don't know him. You see, when Jesus is there, he's zealous, he's full of confidence, he's up for it. But you remove Jesus, he can't even shout down a servant girl. You see, Peter needed Jesus. And I want to say, if you're the kind of person who's up for it, who believes you can do it all, God bless you. But with a God-sized dream, you need God in the middle. Amen. You need Jesus. You need anointing of the Holy Spirit and you need wise people around you so that you go on and write a story that shouts his goodness. And people are going to need to hear that. Here's the grace of Jesus. This guy, you're all zealous. You've walked on water. You've seen the miracles. You've walked with me. And then at the first opportunity, a young girl challenges you and you deny me. Here's the grace of Jesus. John 21 verse 1. After these things... Jesus showed himself again. He showed himself again to disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself again. I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what kind of character you are. I don't know what kind of dreams you've got. But I know this. Jesus is willing to show himself again. If that's going to help you, he's there. He's up for it. And this is what happens. John 21, further down the line. Verses 7 through 9. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with them. Then as soon as they'd come to the land, they saw fire of coals there. Turn to the person next to you, they saw fire. And fish laid on it and bread. Here's the thing. What's happening? Jesus has been let down by his zealous man. But he's willing to show himself again. Do you know why? Because Jesus got, uh, Peter's got a call on his life. 
Peter's got something, a story in him that needs writing. But he's just a guy. He's a zealous guy, but he's just a guy. And he needed Jesus again. So Jesus doesn't back off and say, what's the matter with you? Jesus steps in and says, here I am. And here's what I want you to see here. There was a moment in Peter's life where he denied it all. He lost his confidence. He lost everything. And he was sat by a fire prepared by the enemy. He was sat by a fire, warming himself there, losing his confidence, unsure of what was going on, and he was challenged. So what does Jesus do? He reveals himself again, sat by a fire. And he says, the enemy created a fire and you lost your confidence, but I'm creating a fire to instill confidence in you. Come and sit with me again. Come and eat together. Come on, I still love you. Nothing's changed for me. There's bigness on the inside of you. Let's sit together and feed ourselves. Let's sit together and talk. Let's sit together and empower each other again. And do you know what happens? When Jesus goes to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit. You believe in the Holy Spirit today? And Peter gets up and preaches. He starts to write his story. It says in the word, 3,000 people committed their lives to Jesus in one preach. Why? Because Peter was zealous and passionate and full of faith. But he had a moment away from Jesus and he lost his confidence. And Jesus never gave up on him. In fact, he said, I'll show myself to you again. In fact, he created such an environment that it would have put triggers in Peter's head. I was by the fire and I lost my confidence. And here I am by the fire, but this time with Jesus. And so when he got his moment, he denied Jesus before the servant girl. But now there are thousands of men. But he's had an encounter with Jesus. And he stands up and says, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. You need Jesus. He starts to regale who Jesus is. And hearts and minds are changed. 3,000 people come to know Jesus. And my understanding biblically is 3,000 men. So that's probably potentially 3,000 women as well. So 6,000. Maybe some kids. All these thousands of people came to know Jesus. Why? Because the passionate, faithful, zealous Peter had re-encountered Jesus and got his confidence back. Someone here, you need your confidence back. You're passionate, you're zealous, you are a man or a woman of faith, but somewhere in it all, you've had some knocks and you've lost your confidence. Well, Jesus is willing to sit with you by the fire and say, come on, I've got a plan for your life. I've got a story for you to write. Go and write it. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. In fact, I'm going to empower you from heaven. Let's do this together. Come on, there's some stories to write in this room. And then we see... The same grace showed to David in the Old Testament. And David is the guy we're referring to who is just good at everything. You know, he was a brilliant shepherd. The bear comes, so clearly he just kills the bear. The lion comes, so clearly he just kills the lion. And then he goes up to battle and the entire Israelite army are scared of this one guy. So clearly he just kills the guy. He's just good at everything. He can play the harp so well that demons come out of people. He's one of those blokes. I'm sure we'd have all really liked him. Oh, top guy. Literally everything he does is successful. But he has this massive call on his life. And you find it in 2 Samuel chapter 7 where the prophet says to him, God is going to build his kingdom through you, through your family line. What a call to have on your life. And he's this guy who can just do everything. Everything he touches just works. And the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. He's a man of faith. He loves the Lord. There's no question of that. But he's a guy. And there was a time when he was king. And it was, it was the time when kings should be going to war. And the Israelite armor was super successful. Of course they were because David led it. Always won. But he was supposed to be out at war. And he hadn't gone to war, he stayed at home. And this is a lesson for anyone. Never get lazy. If you're an anointed man or anointed woman, don't get lazy. Because when you get lazy, you always stuff it up. And here is this guy who is good at everything. Here is this guy who is a man of faith. Here is this guy who God has blessed. Here is this guy who the word says has got a heart after God. He's a good guy. But he positions himself in the wrong place out of laziness. Oh, they'll win without me. They don't need me out there. I know I'm supposed to be out at war, but I'm going to have a little chill. And in his little chill, he's walking around on his rooftop and he sees a pretty lady. And he's a man. 
And he sees the pretty lady and he says, I'm the king. I think I could go there. And you know the story. He meets Bathsheba. He gets her pregnant. And he's like, I've got to cover this up. I've got to cover this up. What am I going to do? So he calls Bathsheba's husband back from war to make it look like he slept with her. But her husband Uriah said, I'm not sleeping with her. My comrades are at war. I'm not going to stay at home with my wife while my friends are fighting and dying for our country. I can't do that. Why? Because he was a man of honour. But the trouble is that stuffed up David's plan. So what did he do? He says, I know what I'll do. I'll send him to the front line. That's a death sentence. The people on the front line are going to die. So he sends the guy out to die. Because then he can say, well, he was back with his wife, so clearly they slept together. And now he's died and he can't argue back because he's dead. He's, he's out of a lazy situation. He's found himself in a terrible situation. And now he's lying to cover it up. This is a guy after God's own heart. This is a guy who's good at everything. This is a guy who God's blessed. And he's just had this horrendous bunch of circumstances. Eventually Bathsheba gives birth to the child and the child dies. So now he's got a dead husband, a, a dead son, a, a guilty heart. He's having an absolute horror show. And this is where he writes Psalm 51. Verses 1 through 3 say this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. He is genuinely sorry. And who knows this? God isn't keeping a record to say, well, I'll accept your apology for that one, but definitely not for that one. No, 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 that's not our father. Our father is full of grace. And the moment he said, I acknowledge my sin, God's there, right there. Now, awful things have happened. You can't take them back. But you know what happens? He sets him up to continue writing this story he's always had for him. He's continuing to write the story. Now, it's not ends up being David who builds the temple, but it's his son Solomon who builds the temple. Because David marries Bathsheba, and then God can bless it. And they conceive and have a son Solomon. And you know the story. He goes on to build this magnificent temple, and, and the, the kingdom is built through him. So it came through David. Psalm 51 going on in verse 10 through 12 says this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Can you see it? Jesus doesn't leave him and say you've messed up. The moment he says, I need you, the Holy Spirit's there. Create in me a clean heart. We need to understand the point he's writing that at. And it's a point where he's really stuffed up badly. But God loves him. God doesn't give up on him. Come on, church. We carry the best message on the history of the planet. I feel like so many people who don't know Jesus feel they have a picture of Jesus sitting on a throne wagging a finger. Well, you're not good enough. Well, you're not good enough. Well, you messed it up. Well, you said that. Well, you didn't do that. But that is not the biblical picture of Jesus. Everywhere Jesus says, I'm willing. You know, you've messed up. It's okay. Let's go again. That's our God. He's a God of grace. And these men we're discussing here had big calls on their life. They had big dreams in their heart. But they had wrestles, personality wrestles, faith wrestles, loss of confidence, laziness, positioned themselves all wrong. And what happened on every single time? Jesus showed himself again. And I don't know how you feel about yourself, how you feel about your call, your anointing, what's happening in your world, but I can promise you this. If you come to Jesus, he'll show himself again. Because you have got a call on your life, and you are valid, and you are important. I'd love it if, you know, one day we get to heaven and we're all having a big laugh. You know, you'll be like, I can't believe you married, married, made it, Pastor Barry. You know, we can all have a laugh together. And uh, we look back and go, what, what, what about that? You know, do you know, remember then, 2022, I was having a crisis of confidence. But then I, I just reached out to Jesus and he came to me. And do you know what? I went on and achieved. I went on and I wrote a story. I went on and someone's life was changed because of me. Do you know what? When, yeah, go on. Be encouraged. 
the thing is that, you know, I feel like God's given me, you know, the ability to encourage people. And you probably look at someone like me and go, oh, it's easy for you, Pastor Barry. I promise you it's not. When I started the church, I gave up my job, no income. In the last building we were in, in Norfolk House, you won't know this, but I can tell you now because we've, we've come out of there, our house was the, was the security. If you had all got up and left, and you could have done, we wouldn't be able to pay the bills. And what would have paid the bills? Our house. And yeah, that's not easy to do. I literally put my house on the line for the sake of the kingdom to be advanced in this town. Because I believe in you guys, and I believe in the call that God's put on me. But sometimes you're asked to do something that's proper uncomfortable, and sometimes you just got to do it. Believe me, five years we were in that building. Every year I was going, that's another year done, that's another year done. <laughs> Praise the Lord, someone else has joined the church. <laughs> Here's my story. In a month's time, we're going to move into a better house. And people probably look at me and go, oh, it's all right for you, Pastor Barry. I don't earn loads of money. But I've got a big God. And I was willing to lay my house on the line. And I believe part of the fruit of that is that God said, I'll bless you with a better house. So, you know, I hope some of my life inspires you. But know this, I have my struggles too. I have my wrestles too. But you know what? On every occasion I've learned to do this, Jesus, I need you again. Jesus, I need you again. Jesus, I need you again. And maybe, just maybe, just maybe, you know, I've said a few things that have inspired you. And you've gone away and shared your story to someone else. I think there'll be people all over this town, in fact, because of online church, probably all over this planet, that have been impacted by people like us. Just because we're willing to get together and say, let's do something for Jesus. We can't do it on our own, but together and with him in the middle, what couldn't we achieve? You've got a story to write. And I hope today I'm encouraging you and stirring in you. Interesting that you've come today because I feel like on your birthday, you've got a story to write. It's going to be an exciting story. And I hope, we, you know, whether you stay here or not, I hope one day you'll message me and go, this is what's happened in my life. And I'll be celebrating with you. You're a good man. Maybe you're the cautious type and doubt. Maybe you're overconfident and zealous. Maybe you've become lazy and blasé. Maybe it's something else for you. It could be a number of conditions you find yourself in that you wrestle with. But the message is the same. God will never give up on you. He will never give up on you. The relationship issues are our end, not his. Because the very moment we say, we need you, he's there. He was there for David when he made terrible decisions. He was there for Peter when he denied him to a little girl. He was there for Thomas when he doubted. And he'll be there for you. And here's why. Because there's a story in your life that needs writing. And we need to be big enough and brave enough to take the first step and say, God, I've taken a step, I need you. I'm going to take a second step, I need you. I'm going to take another step, and I need you. I'm not going to take a leap, because that's not where I live, but I can take a step. And every time we take a step, we need to tell the story. Because your one step might be the encouragement someone else needs to take their one step. And then we could have a church full of people taking a step, and another step and another step and what's going to happen is people are going to meet Jesus people are going to get healed people struggling with mental health and anxiety and these things are going to encounter the healer people who are living in doubt and lacking in faith are going to encounter the provider and your life is going to go from here to here because you were brave enough to say I can't do it without you I need you Jesus are you with me? Would you stand? I'd love to pray with you. Hey, let me just invite you to close your eyes as we pray. You don't have to, but I always think it's helpful. Have your moment. Have your moment. We're a great church, but you're also a great individual. And God's got a plan for you. Lord, we pray that prayer that David wrote in that difficult moment in his life. Search our hearts, Lord. Search our hearts. We offer ourselves to you all over again. Could you use what I've got? 
Lord, for those who relate to being a bit blasé and lazy, I pray today's message would be the little kick up the backside we needed. Say, so come on, I've got to get serious about my calling. I've got to get serious about my gifting. I've got to position myself well. Lord, for those who doubt and lack confidence, would you show yourself again in a way that's meaningful to them? Touch hearts again. For those that are fully confident and zealous, we acknowledge we need you. Can't do it on our own. Holy Spirit, move amongst us, I pray. Move amongst us, I pray. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. closed if you really associate with that lacking confidence and maybe being living in doubt about your calling about your gifting about your next step if that's you can just raise your hand because I want to pray for you bless you there bless you there bless you bless you bless you oh wow bless you bless you lots of people thank you Jesus I encourage you at the end to come forward for prayer. You don't have to, but there will be an opportunity for that. But Lord God, you see these amazing people. I speak faith to you in Jesus' name. I speak faith to you in Jesus' name. You are a brilliant person. You're gifted. You're anointed from heaven. You're here on purpose and for purpose. Bless you. We cast out doubt in Jesus' name. And we speak faith. Jesus, would you be close to your family right now? Walk with them, inspire them, give them ideas from your throne room and a heart that's willing to take a step. You guys are so exciting because you're about to start writing stories that will change lives. Jesus. Don't want to rush past him. Maybe just take your own moment to pray your own prayer. Maybe invite Jesus into the middle of it all again. We need him. Thank you, Jesus. So that's the end of today's service. I really hope that you were stirred and encouraged and blessed by that message. And we will be back here again next week. So have a great week and be blessed.